Okay, if I can welcome you all to this, the third meeting of the Public Petitions Committee in 2018. Can I remind members and others in the room to switch their phones and other devices to silent? The first item on the agenda today is consideration of a new petition. Petition 1683 on support for families with multiple births was lodged by Jennifer Edmonston. The petition calls the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to provide better support for multiple birth families, including both financial and non-financial support. Can I welcome Jennifer Edmonston to the meeting, along with Helen Peck, who is Scottish Coordinator of Twins and Multiple Births Association. Can I welcome you both very much for coming along. Thank you for attending. Um, you have the opportunity to make a brief opening statement of up to five minutes. And after that, the committee will ask a few questions, try and help inform our consideration of your petition and see um, if we can tease out some of the issues that you've identified within your petition. So if I can maybe ask you to make a statement, first of all. Hi there. Thanks so much for spending some um, time to see us today. I'm Helen Peck. I'm the Scottish Coordinator for TAMBA, the Twins and Multiple Births Association. Um, I'm here today to support Jennifer, who's an activist and the Secretary um, for East Kilbride Twins and Triplets Club. Jennifer will outline the background of her petition and give you evidence of the unique challenges that our families face. Um, I can also help along the way by sharing some stories which may give um, a little bit of help to better understand. Um, from our point of view, from Tamba's point of view, it's also um, really timely to be here today for three reasons. Um, the government have just announced 1.6 million is to be set aside to support families in neonatal care. This is especially important to our families as 50% spend time in neonatal care and it would be great to know how this will be allocated for multiple birth families um, and those who may have to be transferred from units far away from home. Um, the government also announced that they're looking to support initiatives that fill the gaps. Um, as a charity that have never had government funding before, but deliver many services to support multiple birth families across Scotland, um, it would be great to hear how you could help support us. And also, it would be fantastic if the committee could gather evidence from other departments to see how policies um, could be better to support our families. Okay, and now over to Jennifer. So as you're aware, this petition refers to a mixture of reserved and devolved powers. Appreciating this, I ask that you please don't lose sight of the bigger picture when considering the devolved matters, as this area is only as great as the sum of all of its parts. My aim today is to build on the headline issues from the petition by highlighting what a typical family of multiples is like. Many of the relevant Scottish Government policies I accept are aimed at families more generally, including the baby boxes and certain grants for those in need. However, via this petition, I wanted to show that having a multiple birth is so different in so many ways, and therefore the government need to aim some of its relevant policies directly at families with multiples. Hopefully, you will understand fully just some of the challenges families with multiples have been facing for years, leading to pressure physically, emotionally, and financially. Forget the glamour and the trophy factor portrayed in the media of celebrity parents with multiples. This can often undermine the true struggle. Having multiples is undeniably a privilege, but is full of extreme highs and sometimes some extreme lows. So what is typical multiple life? Well, it starts with a high risk pregnancy and birth. 3% of all UK births are multiples and life can be hard for that small number with multiples being two times more likely to be stillborn and six times more likely to have cerebral palsy than a singleton birth. And for the multiples that are born alive, 68% of twins and 95% of triplets are born, born prematurely compared to 7% of all births. And 15% of triplets and 42% of triplets, uh, sorry, 15% of twins and 42% of triplets are born very prematurely compared to 6% of all births, leading to 52% of twins requiring extra hospital care. However, this does not account for further medical care once discharged from hospital, a common consequence of having premature babies. Extra time spent in hospital can be expensive for a family, what with car park charges, etc., and can require extra time off work. It's therefore understandable that postnatal depression and relationship breakdown are more prevalent in families with multiples. Feeding is another issue I'd like to bring to your attention, as 80% of mothers, multiple mothers, do not breastfeed, compared to 60% of singleton mothers. And for those that exclusively formula feed, it's about £480 per singleton and over double at £1,060 for twins, which of course excludes bottles, sterilisers, electricity costs, which are all doubled. 
Several factors have been accounted for in this, being that 50% of multiples spend extra time in hospital, meaning they're introduced to more expensive brands of formula, and it's not recommended that you switch, so you are often stuck. Unlike first infant milks, follow-on milks are much cheaper and offers are permitted, but using them goes against health visitor advice. And most multiples are born premature, so should be weaned later, at seven months at least, meaning that more expense is spent on formula. Um, nursery fees are also a big issue for us, as we're aware childcare is expensive and can push many families into real financial hardship, even more prominent with families with multiples. To evidence this, I compared the cost of sending two children to nursery on a full-time basis when the mother is back at work. Two children born two years apart was approximately £55,000 over six years. Two children born three years apart, being the national average, was £64,000 over seven years, and having twins was £70,000 over only just a five-year period. So when broken down, what does that mean? The average salary is £22,000-ish net. With having two children and an, on an average salary, one parent will profit every year that their children, sorry, that they are in work. But with having twins on an average salary, between the ages of one and three, the nursery fees exceed one parent's salary, which often mean a parent chooses not to return to work as there's no incentive to. Finally, child benefit. The UK is unusual in paying a premium for the first child born. The government recommend that this should be used for clothes and food as the arrival of the first child has the largest impact on finances. If, a mul if multiples are a mother's first pregnancy, in particular, what hasn't been considered is the requirements by two of many items as th at the same time. Car seats, cots, nappies, food, formula, bottles, bedding, clothes, shoes. It has been estimated that twins doesn't cost double, but it is about 50% more than having one child, and this needs to be accounted for. Just quickly, as a global comparison, France offer an additional 18 weeks maternity leave for twins and 30 for triplets. Ireland, a grant for families at birth and then at age four, and child benefit is one and a half times and two times more than that of a singleton for twins and triplets respectively. And Australia allowed people to pay off their nursery fees over a longer period of time, all which could potentially help. So my conclusion is that families of multiples are asking for help. Ways in which the Scottish Government could help are as follows. Increase and match child benefit for each multiple born, provide more funding earlier for childcare for families with multiples and provide support for improvements in maternity leave, maternity pay and paternity pay by bringing this petition to the attention of Westminster. If improvements like that are made, it's likely that women will be in a better position to return to work sooner and multiples will be put on an equal footing with singletons. Okay, thank you very much for that. I have to say that was absolutely fascinating. <laughs> All the things that you just simply don't think about um, have been presented there and I think that's really captured sort of the issues of the petition itself. So thank you very much for that. Can I maybe uh, start off the question was saying you you were asked what previous actions you had taken and you said you'd spoken to your MP and indicated that she would seek to raise the issue um, of including reference to families with multiple births in employment policies with employers groups. Can I, um, you give us any further information about engagement with employers groups and what sort of responses you've received? I have to be honest, this started with Kirsten Oswald in the beginning and as things changed in my constituency, um, it then got passed on to Jackson Carlaw. So Kirsten Oswald was going to approach employers groups, but obviously that fell by the wayside. And then I started engaging with Jackson Carlaw and Paul Masterton instead, <coughs> who took me on a different path, i.e. ending up here. That's something, obviously, that we can maybe think about in terms of reflecting what employers' organisations' um, views are. Angus MacDonald? OK, thanks, uh, Kavina. Good morning, Jennifer. Good morning, Helen. Um, as you've already uh, acknowledged, uh, some of the laws and policies relating to uh, maternity leave and support for families are reserved uh, to the UK, while others fall within um, the devolved powers to, to Scotland. So if I could concentrate at the moment on the powers that are devolved, uh, which include the, the top up, uh, well, the powers to top up uh, reserve benefits, uh, healthcare services, and early learning and childcare. So, within these areas, can you expand on on your introductory remarks and tell us where you think uh, that further support you're calling for should be prioritised uh, to make the biggest difference to families? I guess I would say. 
like you're saying, childcare is one of the biggest areas and the most problematic for us. Um, it's stopping us from getting back into the workplace because it's just, it's not permitting people to earn enough of a wage to get back. So any form of top up in that sense would be helpful or ways and means of getting children into nur uh, council nursery care would be helpful as well. Helen, do you have anything on that? Yeah. I've actually got quite an, a good story that gives an example of this. Um, a few years ago, I um, dealt with a mother of triplets who lived out in Clickmannan. Her husband worked away from home sort of four months on and was back um, a, a month um, at a time. And um, she was really isolated, finding it really, really hard. Three babies, no family around her at all. Um, her uh, parents lived in Ireland. So finding it a real, real struggle. Um, we had... Uh, we were in frequent contact, to their, contact with her and urged her to contact Homestart to see if they could give her um, a little bit of extra support and a little bit of extra help. But sadly, they didn't have the resources in her area. Um, so then she got into contact with her local council and said, look, I'm really struggling. By this point in time, her, um, her kids were two and quite a handful. And as you can imagine, she had looked at all sorts of options of even trying to get them into, um, you know, like a private nursery. But it was just out with the realms of possibility for her because it was it was far too expensive. Um, so um, we ended up helping her contact her uh, local MSP, who then contacted the council. And they were fantastic um, because one of the local school nurseries that normally wouldn't take children till the age of three her girls I think at that point were two and three quarters made an exception to the rule for, for Isla for two days a week so they took the girls on two mornings a week which for her was categorically a lifeline because um, she had developed quite bad postnatal depression just because she felt so overwhelmed and um, and it was purely by you know speaking to the MSP and going there and, and saying to her this is a real problem this is and this isn't something that just affects mothers with triplets it affects mothers with twins in, in the same situation um, Isla was a nurse so she was very well aware of the signs of postnatal depression um, and also very well aware that in order to, for her to continue being a nurse she would have to um, you know, continue to keep her hours up. But again, she found that very, very challenging just because of the magnitude of having triplets. So this gave her the lifeline that she really, really needed. Okay, thanks for that. Just as a matter of interest, mm -hmm. what council was it? it click manager. All oh, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, click manager. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well done, click manager. Michelle. And, and good morning and well done. I think you spoke very well. Your petition calls for better financial and non-financial support for families with multiple births. Um, and in respect of the non-financial support, one of the areas identified in the background information in your petition is encouraging healthcare professionals to be mindful of m uh, multiple birth families. And on this point, you provide a specific example of providing one prescription stroke minor ailments treatment per child rather than grouping multiples together. Could you explain a little bit more about what grouping multiples together means in this regard? I think it's probably easiest to explain that I have identical twins. So um, usually people see them as a unit. <laughs> um, quite often, I think I, in a famous high street chain pharmacist, uh, I registered my children or so I thought, and I got given what I thought was two minor ailments prescriptions. I then went back a further time and they said, only one of yours has been actually signed up. We need to sign up the other one. So what they had been doing was been giving, had been giving me one prescription pair for both my children, which seems to be, it's not, it's not across the board, but it's not <laughs> uncommon as well. And I think other people have seen that, that sometimes people get confused between the fact that these are two separate people <laughs> and that they both need help. So that's a specific example of where I was going with that. That would seem a, an issue with the pharmacy because legally they have to be individuals for, for treatment and prescription. So I think that's why I was a little confused by it. <laughs> Definitely. It, it's just seeing that these are two individuals who are quite... I, it was maybe not the right example to use, but quite mm -hmm. often my two get grouped together. And I think that's more with identical twins, perhaps, than yes. fraternal twins. Right. So, that, so that's um, about perception and the way in p which people react. And I think yeah. that kind of is kind mm -hmm. of an example of how everything's portrayed. You know, I'm, I've always been treated as if I've had one birth and one child. Mm -hmm. But actually, I've had one birth and two children. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Can I just ask a supplement? Um, when we're looking at healthcare um, practice, and you talked quite a bit in, in your opening statement around what happens particularly around the premature birth and the impact of not being able to breastfeed. Now, w one of the pieces of work that's, that's quite significant in Scotland has been working really well is the Milk Donor Bank. And I know that there's a huge amount of, of um, breast milk being donated out, particularly to the neonatal units, and we now have quite an efficient system of supporting that. Have you actually come across that? Because obviously that is that is a major way of actually solving that problem. I, I haven't used any donor milk myself. I have asked about it and was told that wasn't allowed at one stage, um, but I think maybe I wasn't in the right circumstances for that. Your children now? My children are a year and a half. Right, okay. This was this was earlier on. My my one of my daughters was having an operation, and um, I was looking to get her. F I was hoping to use donor milk because I had no milk by this stage, and it meant that you you didn't need to starve her for eight hours. <laughs> um, but I was told that wasn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't be allowed it for that. That's the only ever time I've come across donor milk. Personally, sir, um, well, going to be fourteen on Saturday. <laughs> I have identical twin girls as well. Um, and certainly when um, it wasn't <laughs> no <laughs> it's more of a new for me. Yeah. no but I mm. um, I do work quite closely with um, a lot of the neonatal networks mm -hmm. and I know the um, the milk bank is an amazing scheme it, is, it really yeah. is it's fantastic yeah. they've done a lot of work on that um, we were involved with Una McFadgen in the very very sort of early stages mm -hmm. of that and it's mm -hmm. fantastic so do you feel that is now contributing to solving some of that issue um I think partially, yes, I think we're kind mm. of sort of a long way to go. I think um I think that, that whole situation is sort of tainted with, with other issues that maybe go along with it as well, sort of like mothers being encouraged to breastfeed mm -hmm. in hospitals, which mm -hmm. um I know from we run a lot of antenatal classes and a lot of practical preparing for parenthood classes, so we have sort of first hand contact with the mums. And um I know in some hospitals um, purely, I think, because the midwives are so busy, mm -hmm. um, it's not. It hasn't been encouraged, shall we say, as much as it should be. Or some mums have been made to feel um, almost slightly put down by the fact saying, "Oh, you've got two, you'll never manage that." Mm. When actually, the reality is that if they want to, yeah. um, there are methods. There to are methods. That. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's something we we could look at and need to work on yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah and, and for the spe feeding specialists, I know that, that quite a few of them have been cut in certain areas, mm -hmm. and I definitely think had I had more support, I would have had better chance at, yeah, at succeeding mm -hmm. in breastfeeding. Although I can't confirm or <laughs> <laughs> at the moment. No, yeah. support does help. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I'm being advised here by Angus Macdonald, who's been to the petitions committee for a lot longer than me, that in fact the National Donor Milk Bank came as a consequence of a petition to this committee. And that petition was closed in April 2013. So, there you go. Um, Brian Whittle. Thank you. Good morning. Um, from reading your petition and, and some of the background material and, and your presentation uh, earlier on, uh, we'd understand that one of the core concerns is Underpinning of positions that families with multiple births, uh, the issue of financial cost is not just the case of multiplying the costs, as you've alluded to, that would apply for most uh, singleton births, but there, there are uh, additional costs arising as a result of the circumstances that uh, are more likely to arise in the case of multiple births. So as, as you've already said, uh, you know, the, the multiple births are more likely to be premature, costs of childcare uh, uh, arising at the same time. And I just wondered, you know, um, uh, at the risk of making me shudder here, having <laughs> uh, what other experiences uh, are multiplied? Uh, if you've got some examples of some experiences are multiplied in the cases of multiple births. Yes, the big one coming up for me at the moment is shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone that's a parent knows that shoes are very expensive. But you know, on on a more serious note, like I was saying, it is the equipment in the startup. Yeah. You know, all the, the car seats, you, you, there's no way you mm. can have one. <laughs> the cots, the um, the double buggy, I know that's not two things, but it is a bit more yeah. of an expensive bit of kit. Um, and, yeah, it's not doubled, but there's definitely an impact. And I think Helen and I have spoken about this, that those first five years are just that crucial point. Challenging. And <laughs> Helen can give you a bit more of an example, maybe yeah. later on it maybe lessens a bit beginning is the tough time financially. Yeah. I mean, even before your babies arrive, mm -hmm. um, or 
when your babies arrive before you've got them home. If your babies arrive particularly early, which is for our parents is commonplace, um, I know families that have spent their life savings commuting back and forward to neonatal care because their babies have been in hospital for a long time. Both babies don't necessarily get charged, discharged from hospital at the same time, so the journey can be even longer. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> so from the beginnings where, I mean, most families, you, you don't plan, you don't go out to plan to have a multiple pregnancy and then when you find out you're pregnant with two or three or four, um, you know, it, what you maybe thought was like your idea of... Um, of the way life would be is kind of turned upside down. So things that you budgeted for, you thought, I never really budgeted to have to buy two of these or two yeah. of these or two of these. And, and if you don't have other children like myself, um, I didn't have the joy of having anything that I could hand down, you know? So um, this sort of reusable market wasn't there. I mean, and I know like I relied very heavily on things like NCT sales and things like that to be able to afford to buy things mm -hmm. um, in the early day because it was such a massive, amount of things and certainly I know with the baby box that that will contribute to a degree but also some of the stuff that's in the baby box whilst the box is fantastic the stuff that's inside it we some of our mums won't be able to use from the very beginning because it doesn't it's not teeny tiny sizes you know well, I, think, I think as Helen's you know it's the buying two of everything I need to dress both children I had this naive thought that I might have one wardrobe which I could have between the two of them but that just does not happen you know everything and I think Helen picked up on the the costs when you're in hospital I mean I was lucky that my children were in the same hospital but yes they also got discharged at different times but to be in a different hospital and car parking charges and nowhere to eat other than the, the hospital food and you find yourself stuck and in a bit of a robotic um, way for a while because you're just living day to day. Your partner's had to take time off work, you're taking time off work, you're eating into those holidays and co the costs just can mount up very quickly even in the average multiple birth. Um, yeah. yeah. I've broken in a cold sweat. A great deal more sympathy. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I thought they got the, the cute quotient very high. But, um, actually, I think Mark Griffin MSP has had a campaign round supporting families where there's a child in hospital, neonatal care, and so on, and looking at that whole issue of the extra cost that's associated with that. And I think the Scottish government has responded very positively to that. So that's maybe they have they have got a sense of that, and it may be something they could extrapolate to to the issues that you've highlighted. Um, Rona Mackay. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Um, can I just follow on on that theme about financial support? Um, you, your petition says that uh, you know the first child um, benefit is twenty pounds seventy, and then thereafter it's thirteen pounds um, seventy. What level of support do you think? Would you like to see both your children or or, or all children in multiple births being paid the first level, the first child support? I mean, that would be the optimum. Um, mm. I think I, I definitely see it differently because, like Helen, my two are my first two, and again, there's no sharing. And I did I read the child benefit policy back from the 90s and why child benefit came about and why the first child got more, and that really was because it's it puts you in a different financial position. And I feel that Tamba are very good at supporting us. And ever since day one, they told you me that my children we're the same, they're equal. And then it comes to child benefit and I'm doing a calculation and my standing order has to put the two together and separate my child benefit every month so that they get the same. And I just don't understand why that 12 minutes in time should make a difference. What the amount should be, I'm not sure, but I think there's the discrepancy is too much that the first, I think they should be on the same level, whatever they are. Twins should be or triplets or more should be treated in the same way. Do you have any? I would I, I would agree with Jennifer. It is um it's it is the, the, the same, you know, you have two babies at one time, you have three babies at one time, twenty minutes apart, twelve minutes apart. Um and why should there be a discrepancy between them? Because it's not that you're having one child and then sort of a half child. That other child is a child in its own right as well. So, um, yeah, I, I would agree. Again, as to what it should be, I don't know. That would be 
something that um, would have to be thought about, but even a sort of a fear or split or just something, recognising the fact that um, it is financially really challenging for families. And, um, and this, I'm talking you know, families even who are middle earners, it's really financially challenging for them <clears> in the beginning. I mean, I remember speaking to um, Wendy Alexander years ago when, um, when her babies were born and, um, you know, she she was fantastic, had a, um, a really good sort of interview with us and uh, said that she had absolutely no comprehension at all of how like expensive it was to have twins and the magnitude of the, the effect that the whole thing would have on her life. And as much as she wouldn't have changed it for the world, the, there is no getting away from the fact that the first sort of few years um, are particularly financially challenging. And I would say it takes five years to kind of get out of the financial bit from baby to sort of the time they go to school when things seem to even out a bit. And I think Ireland has shown with their child benefit changes, so what is it, one and a half times more for those of twins and two times more for those with triplets. They've shown a discrepancy in their child benefit and I think that's really interesting mm -hmm. to see that. Um, I don't know if you probably are aware, but um, under the new devolved social security powers, the government is proposing, it's, it's not been um, settled yet, proposing um, maybe a £300 payment um, to parents of, of multiple birth children mm -hmm. and, and thereafter their the normal, you know, normal child benefit. Can I ask you your opinion on that? Can I ask, is that means tested? I don't believe it will be, no. Okay. I, I think any step in the right direction personally is, is a positive uh -huh. step. Mm -hmm. Whether yeah. it's enough, I would question that. Mm -hmm. um, I found my, in my personal circumstance, I am an okay earner and I've had to take a career break. I don't think 300 pounds would have changed that for me. That'll be me two and a half years out of my legal career. But it could so help you with startup. Costs. It could definitely yeah. help um, me there. Yeah. But it wouldn't maybe help the getting yeah, back to work going. Uh -huh. But yeah, it would be it, any step in the right direction mm -hmm. would be a good step. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Um, just finally, um, I understand that TAMBA was established in 1978 and has been campaigning and providing support for families with multiple births since that time. I'm horrified to say that it's 40 years, but anyway, in that 40 years period, um, have you seen any overall change in the way that multiple births are understood and supported by governments, healthcare providers and so on? And I'd also be interested in, it, you've alluded to it a couple of times, the pressure on families, the emotional, I mean, a new baby is a huge emotional pressure anyway, but if you're disproportionately likely to be in hospital, disproportionately likely to have late discharge, all those kind of anxieties, early, a premature birth. What kind of support is available that, that's, that kind of, is there something that kind of clicks in on a basis that you have, once it's been identified you're having a multiple birth, are there extra supports that are there or do you think there, there, there could be more done in that regard? So I would say from, from a TAMBA perspective, I mean, yes, I, I would definitely agree that especially over from in Scotland, um, over the last sort of three to four years, our relationship with the Scottish government has blossomed, shall I say? You know, and, and I think that we have done quite a good job of making people more aware of the challenges that our family um, face, and you know they're really supportive of that. However, what would be um, we do, as I, as I said earlier, try and sort of fill the gaps in um, where people are needing support that they don't necessarily get from the hospital. I mean, one of the things that we do just now, which is um, we have a, a year-long um, funding bid from Awards for All Scotland, which enables us to um, provide midwife-led antenatal sessions, day-long antenatal sessions for free for every family in Scotland. Um, we do them through maternity units and... I can honestly say that within 24, 40 hours of putting that on the website, the session will fill. We get 20 people, we take a maximum of 20 people at each, each session. Um, and it's great that a lot of the hospitals support it because that is not something that they now provide in, to, to the same extent that we do, um, purely with sort of financial cuts and things like that. Um, and it's something that we would hope that we would still be able to provide for for a long term um, time coming. Um, other things that we do, so yeah, f our families, you know, they do, they go through a, a, quite a hard time to begin with. A, um, a lot of people end up with um, sort of postnatal depression um, purely because of the overwhelming nature of um, their multiple pregnancy. Um, TAMBA operate um, something called Twinline, 
which is a helpline which is run by volunteers. Now, um, it's a phone helpline. All our volunteers are trained and are all um, parents of multiples. So we have all been there, um, you know, be able to advise. We also have a group of honorary consultants who are specialists in their field. So if um, somebody would come to us with, um, you know, a query, say, about... Um, the children going to school and whether the children should be separated in different classes. You know, we can we can give them sort of specialist advice on you know what they should do, what they should, or how they should approach their school, for example. So we're there, kind of filling the gaps with that. And um, with bereavement support, we understand that there are other um, you know bereavement support group, groups out there, like Sands, who do a marvellous job, and Sands Lothian. Um, but we run our own um, sort of specialist bereavement support group for families of multiples because as I'm sure you can appreciate um, the loss of losing a twin or both twins or triplets or one out of three triplets is it's very very um, difficult and it's much more different than um, <coughs> than sort of the pain that um, families who have lost one baby, I'm not saying it's any worse or but it, it's different because you, if you have identical twins, for example, you still have the constant reminder every day as you watch your other child grow that its other sibling is not there. And it's very challenging. And also if their babies are in neonatal care and you're, um, you're a mum you know, and you've got one surviving child in neonatal care, that can be really, really distressing as well because you know, people see your baby and they treat you as a mum, but actually in your heart you're still a twin mum because you carried two babies for such a long time. On a personal level, I just want to echo what Helen's saying because I'm just a twin mum, I'm not part of Tamba mm -hmm. and Tamba have been a really great support, particularly in their antenatal classes and I've not tapped into some of the other points Helen said but everything she said I echo and any more funding for them to provide these services would be fantastic. The financial issues and emotional issue there as well and kind of pressures that yep. new mums have anyway. Yes. Michelle? Um, just on a, another point, the childcare which you, you features on quite heavily in terms of returning to work and having that freedom to, to get some breathing space, I suppose, more than anything else. Um, obviously, the, the 600 hours of childcare came in previously and, and the 1140 offer has started to roll out now and, and should be in place for every child by 2020. Are you getting any feedback from your parents? Are they able to access that? Are they benefiting from that? Because that should presumably make quite a big difference to multiple... Yeah, I uh, think at, at the moment, um, the, the one thing that... I, I think parents are really grateful of the extra hours of childcare that they can get. The, the one thing I would say that's kind of sort of pertinent to our families is that the first three years are so financially challenging sometimes that... Um, it makes it almost like, like say for example, once your maternity leave's finished, and you would be thinking, oh, I might return to work. It's the two years before your sort of your state childcare kicks in, um, that kind of makes it impossible for you, not for everybody, but for a lot of our parents to return to work, um, because of the sort of the financial challenges that they face in the first three years, you know, from the baby's being born, um, to them going to nursery. I have to say I was delighted when mine went because at that stage they had upped it by half an hour and it was like, yes, it's fantastic. Things you can get done in half an hour. <laughs> and I think Helen and I have both been affected by that. Yeah. So, so, so that that gap. age one to... One to three, one yeah. To yeah. Three. yeah. yeah. Or yeah. zero to three, whatever. Yeah. Which yeah. Area. Can I just thank you again um, very much. We now have to think about how we want to take the petition forward. Can I maybe ask that the, the figures, the statistics you quoted in your opening statements, if you could make them available to the clerks, that would be um, really useful in, in our pursuing the, the petition. And I wonder if members have suggestions about how we might take this forward. I think there's a comment. Uh-huh, as long as it's not rude. <laughs> <laughs> You know me so well, can you? Know? <laughs> um, just, uh, just, uh, I wonder. Obviously, I think we should be writing to the Scottish government mm -hmm. uh, and the UK government to, to get their uh, their views. But I wonder within that uh, whether there's a query because one of the things that, that's popped out there is around childcare and around around the beginning of, of a free childcare, which is currently four and five year olds and some vulnerable three year olds. And I wonder whether what, what the, there's a three, four, and vulnerable two, so. that's the one. Um, <laughs> I'm wondering whether there's 
possibility of a differentiation there with multiple births in terms of an earlier start with child care? As, as a question, I don't know. There's one thing that occurred to me, if there's particular pressure on um, maybe isolated mums or mums without support or families without support, whether they might, would that category of vulnerability be um, identified as perhaps just simply being a, a multiple birth and, and the pressures of that? That's, I think, a reasonable question to ask. I think we should certainly write to the, the Scottish Government. Um, we've had some representation from Tamba, but it may be that they, they might want to say something more. You mentioned Home Start, and I would be interested in how... I know they do fantastic work at a very local level. Is this an issue that they're aware of? Um, anyone else? I think we should um, write to the Royal College of Midwives and seek some of their views around this. And also, I mean, I think from a health point of view, um, there are issues around that starting point. I mean, I, I think the Milk Donor Bank is, is increasing its work significantly, but I think we could double-check there in terms of the input mm -hmm. around not using formula because... Obviously, that would make a huge difference as well yeah. to mums. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Child poverty action group. Mm -hmm. Child poverty action groups, yeah. Um, and Angus? In addition to the Royal College of Midwives, also the Royal College of Nursing mm -hmm. uh, and the Multiple Births Foundation. And I think maybe we could ask the clerks, look, as if there are other child poverty groups or groups that are involved trying to, you know, bliss or these organisations that will be aware of some of the issues for multiple births. Causal as well, I think, would be... Um, worthwhile contact. You, you mentioned um, what was done in Ireland, and I wonder again if we could ask the clerks to have a look at what the, what the kind of different offers are to families in different parts of um, in other in other countries, maybe within Europe. Yeah. Could they, could they also Just check um, around things like prescriptions, etc., because I'm pretty sure it is it is a legal requirement for individuals. But I think we should just clarify that so that mm -hmm. that. Tambor and, and mothers can advise that mm -hmm. if that is done or mm -hmm. said that it should be mm -hmm. corrected. Mm -hmm. I was just, just going to say, Convener, uh, when looking at other countries, it's, it's been alluded to, I think France have a quite an interesting approach to this okay. as well. So I think certainly it's opened up a whole series of issues. I think the financial one is really the most challenging, but also I think a lot of the emotional issues, issues around, I mean, those figures that you quoted at the beginning are quite... Maybe I should have known it, but they're quite stark, and not just in financial terms, but in terms of emotional when you're setting out on this journey. So I think there's a whole series there that we can um, raise. And um, if on reflection after the committee session there's anything further you want to provide the committee with, please feel free to do so. We'll make contact, and of course we'll be in contact with you once we get submissions back from these organisations. So um, I think unless there's anything else, can I thank you very much? Sorry? Put one thing through as well, when Tambor are writing, um, the other issue is around multiple births that occur not as the first birth. Yeah. Um, and I think it would be worth just including your commentary around that, because obviously the financial implications are slightly different, but I think it would be worth including that as well, sure. because otherwise we might get focused on just that first birth. Yeah. Sure. OK. Um, can I thank you very much for your attendance? I think that's been very interesting, very useful, and I'm looking forward to the responses um, that we um, get. I've never been so grateful to have only had one child at a time. <laughs> I, I didn't realise how, fortunate, <laughs> how fortunate I was. Anyway, can I thank you very much? And I'm going to suspend briefly while the witnesses leave the table. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you.
call the meeting back to order and can we now move on to our next petition on our agenda this morning, which is the petition 1408 by Andrea MacArthur, which calls for, Scotch, for the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to review and overhaul the current outdated and ineffective method of diagnosing and treating pernicious anemia, vitamin B12 deficiency. Members will recall at our last consideration of this petition in October, we agreed to write to the Scottish Government to ask whether the recently established Haematology Short Life Working Group would meet with the petitioner and keep her informed of the progress of its work. The petitioner met with the Short Life Working Group in February and described it as, quote, a very positive experience. The petitioner also confirmed that the working group would continue to liaise with her. The petitioner's submission highlights two specific issues out with the control of the working group. In relation to vitamin B12 injections, more details of which are contained in our meeting papers, um, the petitioner has con contacted appropriate stakeholders in relation to these issues and has been advised that there are concerns relating to the safety and efficacy of the injection as well as the licence of the vaccination being unable to be changed. Members will be aware the issues to do with the licensing of medicines are out with the Parliament's purview and I wonder if members have any suggestions how might we might take this forward. Michelle? Um, yeah, I, I think to a great extent we've probably gone as far as we can with this one. Um, I mean, the responses were fairly clear in terms of obviously it being out with devolved powers, in terms of relicensing or changing the licensing positioning, and also the efficacy of um, um, injecting. Or, and, and I think we're, we'd be running into problems further on that actually we can't solve anyway. So I think that the responses were quite rational. Um, and I, I think the petitioner probably needs to be satisfied with it. Mm -hmm. It is where it is at the moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think the fact that the petitioner did say that the meeting was a very positive one is encouraging. Yeah. Angus? Yeah, um, just to say, Convener, uh, this is another petition that's been ongoing for, for some time, I think since 2011. Um, but it's good to see that, uh, that, that there has been uh, some, some progress. Um, I, I'm pleased to see that as you mentioned, the petitioner had a, a very positive meeting with the uh, representatives of the Short Life Working Group. Um, and it's also encouraging to see that the, the Short Life Working Group has pointed the petitioner in the direction of, of appropriate stakeholders to address the, the two, or to try to address the two outstanding issues. So I, I would agree with uh, Michelle Ballantyne that um, uh, given the, the, the progress that it's made, while it's not um, complete, uh, I think we can close the petition, given given we can take it no further forward at this stage. Okay. Any other views? Are people yeah. content with that, Rona? Totally content. With that. I mean, I, I think it has to be looked upon as a partial success story, and that the petitioner um, will be liaising with the working group, and she's appreciative of that. Um, and I, I mean, as as has been said, I think we've taken it as far. The petitioner is in now engaged. Um, mm -hmm. You know, with with some with people who can actually affect change. So, yeah. I think for that reason, we we should close. Okay, I think if, if that's the case, that we are agreeing to close the petition under Rule Fifteen Seven of Standing Orders. I think on the basis that the petitioner has met with the Haematology Short Life Working Group, and that the group is committed to continue liaising with, and I think we'd want to thank the petitioner for highlighting these issues, for a persistence in pursuing them, and I think in the recognition that there has been a response to the issues that she has highlighted. So if that's agreed, we can move on to the next petition, which is petition 1545 by Anne Maxwell on behalf of Muir Maxwell Trust on residential care provision for the severely learning disabled. At our last consideration of this petition in October, we agreed to ask the Scottish Government what information it needed to make recommendations about the strategic direction to support people with learning disabilities with complex needs. We also asked the Scottish Government to respond to the petitioner's specific concerns that the work streams commissioned to address the data visibility of people with learning disabilities in Scotland were largely focused on the prescription and effect of antipsychotic drugs, which does not present the group of people the petitioner represents. The Scottish Government's response confirms that the Scottish Learning Disabilities Observatory is conducting a project on antipsychotic medications use with adults and children with learning disabilities. However, it states that this is only one project within a much larger programme of work aimed at addressing the diverse needs of people with learning disabilities in Scotland. The Government submission states that the Observatory is happy to supply more information on any aspect of this work to the committee. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action? Uh, Brian? 
I think, Convener, um, it would be interesting to get the petitioner's response uh, to the submissions we've had uh, in the first instance to mm -hmm. see what they, what they think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Rona? I, mean, I think we should, the observatory have, have offered to supply more information, and I think we should we should ask them for that. We should um, definitely find out more. I mean, I was a wee bit puzzled by, 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 by the response in the sense that I, I'm not sure that... Um, the whole of the petitioner's um, ask was, was being addressed. Um, so I think we just need to, to find out, uh, as has been said, more, more from the petitioner about, about what, what she really feels about the, the government's submission, get the information from the observatory. But I, I, I just feel it's kind of been partially addressed, yes. the yes. issue. I think it continues to be this question that they're, look, they're focusing on one aspect. Yeah. And I suspect the petitioner's probably still pretty frustrated with that, but yeah. I think that's something... Um, we can ask for the mm. petitioner to do is that agreed then mm -hmm. that we ask the, um, the the petitioner to make a written submission in response to the Scottish Government submission but I think taking up uh, Rona's suggestion as well that we seek the information that was offered from the observatory yeah. and, and specifically around what the petitioners asked are to ask the observatory to respond directly yeah. to the provision you know the suggestion that should be the provision of residential care because they haven't they haven't answered that question okay we can then move on to the next petition for consideration, which is Petition 1596 on In-Care Survivor Service Scotland by Paul Anderson, James McDermott and Chris Daly. At our last consideration of this petition in October, we agreed to ask the Scottish Government about the role of the Survivor Engagement Manager and progress with its engagement plan at that time. The Scottish Government submission notes that some survivors have spoken directly to the Survivor Engagement Manager and that the Survivor Engagement Manager attends meetings between Future Pathways and survivor representative organisations, which it says has provided to be useful for survivors. The bulk of the Scottish Government submission focuses on the new Future Pathways model for survivor support services and outlines a range of measures that is incorporated within the model to encourage and facilitate ongoing engagement. One of the concerns previously expressed by the petitioner was whether survivors have the opportunity to provide input to decisions taken about their future health. The Scottish Government submission explains that if a survivor accesses support through the Future Pathways model, the first step within that is to have a discussion with their support coordinator. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Angus, sorry. Right, thanks, um, Camilla. I, I think it's, uh, it's fair to say that the Initial concerns which, which existed with regard to funding of the in-care uh, survivor service Scotland have, have largely been addressed uh, through v various uh, channels. Um, and, and the introduction of the Future Pathways, uh, which you mentioned, gives survivors receiving support from the, the charity uh, Wellbeing Scotland, which used to be open secret, mm -hmm. uh, additional support and access to the, the discretionary fund as well, which, uh, which is good news. Um, so I would say that the petition has delivered a result, mm -hmm. which is good to see. I, th I think maybe f from my perspective, I sit in the cross-party group on um, adult survivors of child sexual abuse, wellbeing Scotland and other organ survivor organisations are there. And I would be interested maybe just checking mm -hmm. or asking their response, you know, maybe wellbeing Scotland in particular, but if there were other organisations mm -hmm. in that field, because what I detect from the group um, that cross-party group, is that there is anxiety still about the motivation behind Scottish Government strategy. That's not to say not, they're not doing a lot of good work, but there, there is this ongoing debate about how best you support somebody who's dealing with trauma. And the suggestions from some of these organisations is that Scottish Government has a kind of a fixed view, whereas, like, Open Secret as was, offered a more holistic understanding that, you know, it wasn't about... Um, it was about how you deal with a person who has been through trauma um, rather than some of the other models, which are very... You've got six weeks and then you move on in the process. So I wonder if, if you would be willing to accept perhaps we could test, not so much with a survivor who, who had the petition, but with some of these survivor organisations, just what they feel about what the, the Scottish Government response has been, if that was acceptable. Michelle and then Brian. Yeah, I, 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 reading through it, I was slightly confused because the, the petitioner was making quite a clear statement around what he wanted. Obviously, the government have taken a different route and were saying, well, this different route will will meet the needs. But but there did seem still to be a gap. 
between what the petitioner was saying in his in his request and what the government's response was, because he didn't want that mm -hmm. that um, triage type route, mm -hmm. um, and that seemed to be the crux of the the type of care that mm -hmm. was given. So I I would be supportive of the idea of going to a committee and actually mm -hmm. saying could we have some feedback and also. Uh, I mean, the peti petitioner's response to it would be interesting too. Thank you, Brian. I, 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 would, I would echo that. I think that um, for our own to, clo to, to, to close the, 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 this, this petition, I'd, be, I'd like to understand the level of comfort or, or, or are the organisations comfortable with uh, the progress, the undoubted progress that has been made um, and uh, if, 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 they are, if they are understanding of the of that progress um, it speaks directly to the to mm. petition and, and gives us the opportunity to close the petition. I think we're almost there. It's just mm -hmm. that little bit of... Angus? Yeah, um, just to say, as I understand it, and I could be wrong, but uh, I think the government has listened to, mm. to, to Wellbeing Scotland, formerly Open Secret, um, to the extent that they didn't um, completely close down that service. Mm -hmm. That service mm -hmm. is still available if, if anyone... Uh, still requires it, so but it would be good to get clarification yes. on it. Yeah. I, th I think you're right. I think the suggestion from the our paperwork is that there has been movement, but I just would be quite keen to test. I think, to be fair, um, with the survivors' organisations rather than perhaps just simply going back to sit the 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 person who's who's uh, brought the petition forward, give us a sense if there has been if that has followed been yeah. followed through, um, and I think we can we can maybe liaise with the. Uh, the cross-party group round some of the organisations that would be able to do that, if that was acceptable. I'm unclear as to when Future Pathways started, you know, and so mm. what progress and, and, and the, the feelings towards that, um, you know, because I just, I don't know the timings of the, yeah. the whole thing. So I mean, it's, it's a massive issue and a changing okay. landscape, obviously, because mm. of the, the issue around um, the inquiry, the sense of that the very fact of having the inquiry may encourage people to come forward to disclose what's happened to them, and there's a general anxiety then about what level of support is going to be available to them and what kind of support and, and whether it's ongoing support for people. I think that's something we can pursue. Says IC Triple S, we're at the meeting. It doesn't give any indication of, of what the commentary was or what the feelings were, mm -hmm. which kind of left me wondering. Yeah. You know, is saying they were at the meeting a tick in the box? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think the suggestion is that we, we, we write to the convener of the cross-party group and that would afford us the opportunity maybe to test it in that direct way. Okay, in that case, can we um, can I thank you for that and can we move on to the next petition, um, which is petition 1603, ensuring greater scrutiny, guidance and consultation on armed forces visits to schools in Scotland, which was lodged by Mary Campbell Jack and Douglas Beattie on beha behalf of Quaker in Scotland and Forces Watch. And can for, a, for this item, can I welcome Edward Mountain MSP, um, who has shown an interest in this petition in the past. And thank you for your attendance. Our last consideration of this petition, we heard evidence from representatives of the armed forces about the work that is carried out in relation to school visits. We invited the petitioners to make a written submission in response to that evidence, and that submission has been received. The petitioners remain concerned about armed forces' visits to schools and have set out a number of options they suggest the committee could consider, and I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Brian? I have, I have to say... Uh, um Convener, at the last, uh, at the, la the last time we, we gave evidence, I, I was kind of on, uh, on a mind that, uh, that, that we'd gone as far far with this petition as we could go, and that I've got to say I was satisfied at that point uh, with the submissions from uh, the armed forces that they were uh, conducting themselves in a manner that we would hope they would, and I was. I, and I was Almost then, saying uh, uh, decided that I thought we should we should uh, close the petition under those uh, under those uh, circumstances. And but I was I, I was prepared to take a little bit more evidence, allow the petitioners the opportunity to respond um, to that. And, and I have to say now, uh, my my opinion is that uh, this petition has gone as far as we need it to go. And, and if I could suggest that uh, we consider closing this petition at this point. Okay, Angus. Yeah, rather than 
close the petition at, at, at this point. I, I think there may be some merit in, in the committee compiling a report on the committee's uh, consideration of the petition, given uh, that we have mm -hmm. taken extensive evidence, um, uh, particularly the, the, the last session uh, that we looked at it. So um, it would also help the petitioners to um, to uh, you know move 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 forward mm -hmm. basically and yeah I think our, our report is the way forward. Okay, it'd be interesting people's views in that. Rona and then Edward. Um, yeah, I disagree with my colleague Brian Whittle entirely that the petition should be closed. I agree with my other colleague that mm -hmm. we should have a report. I still have uh, concerns around data collection. I feel we, sh we don't know what materials are being used in schools during these visits. We have no idea. Um, we haven't seen them. Um, and I, I don't actually feel much further forward in my own, clear in my own mind from when this petition first came to us that we've actually answered any of the questions. So I, I think there's, there's more work to be done here. Okay, uh, Edward. Uh, thank you, convener. And can I say at the outset, uh, I've been grateful to be allowed to follow this petition, and I'm very grateful as well to the <coughs> the uh, input that you've allowed me to have in, into the committee. Can I just say that I, I was taken by the evidence that I'd heard from the Army, Navy and Air Force, who attended schools only when asked, and they made that very clear. They also made it clear that they weren't recruiting when they went, they were sometimes just raising awareness and engaging with the community. I also was very aware that when they gave evidence in that there has been a modal shift since 2014 with much more internal monitoring of visits, very careful messaging, and to be more inclusive about the services as an employer. Uh, I also just would like to just reiterate that I was a soldier for 12 years, and this is not all about bearing arms when you're a soldier. A lot of soldiers do other things, such as keeping the peace, which I did in Cyprus, delivering ethnic food, uh, some food to ethnic minorities in Africa and, and Cyprus where they couldn't get it, helping in refugee camps and running them, and training also to incre increase the standard of awareness of soldiering. And it, it requires a dedication and commitment. And what worries me slightly is that this petition assumes that the army is going into schools to recruit people um, just on the basis that they couldn't get another job. I can absolutely tell you that when the going gets tough, you actually need committed soldiers who are volunteers. I, I, I've looked at what the petition have asked for, and they've asked for uh, child rights impact assessment. And, and I actually find that, that that's quite an odd thing to request. I mean, the services are incredibly aware when they go into schools, the impact uh, of, of their visit and will take into the absolute consideration of the age group and the people that they're uh, addressing. There was a call for additional scrutiny and guidance. Well, the forces have made it clear that since 2014, this is very much the case. They also uh, wanted to, uh, the petitioners wanted to be people to be aware of the issues of forces recruitment. And I absolutely believe that the forces have an obligation to make sure that people understand what they're taking on. As I said earlier, you don't want somebody in a situation, a tough situation, who doesn't know or isn't a volunteer. They ask for involvement in guidance, and they've asked for um, commitments from the armed services, and they've asked for guidance for school visits. Now, I could go through why I think that's all uh, been achieved and, and been given by the army, but it seems a strange situation that we have uh, the services, which are hugely respected in this country uh, across all groups of people that are being asked to do things way beyond the needs of other uh, organisations. And, and, you know, we don't ask other organisations that go into schools, such as the police or any other employers, to, to make these commitments. And I believe that we have heard very clearly from the services that they take their commitment seriously. And I, I think to push this petition further would actually may well damage the, uh, the, the view that people have of the armed services. And, and therefore, I, I, I would humbly ask that, that, that you consider following the suggestion of, of my colleague, Mr Whittle. Thank you. Although Thank writing you. a report, um, as suggested by Angus MacDonald, afford the opportunity for that argument to be prosecuted within the report. I mean, that would reflect some of the evidence. I mean, that's something that we, we need to think about. It's, it's not a choice between 
closing it and continuing forever, but it would be perhaps an Angus suggestion to kind of sum this up through um, uh, a, a, a report which would reflect on the balance of evidence that has been heard. Can I just welcome Maurice Corey, MSP, for this item um, as well? I, I mean, before I take anybody else, I suppose what I would say is that, that at one level, you're not going to get agreement. In my sense, is there are folk who think that um, the armed forces are so unique that they shouldn't go into schools and that they wouldn't want young people to be encouraged to choose it as a, a, as a career option. I'm clear in my own head that as long as you've got armed forces and mean armed forces, then it's a legitimate career choice for people. I'm also clear that there has been a change in my lifetime. Um, and I made it, it's been commented on before, but the, the story about the Billy Connolly song, which talks about somebody who's ended up um, in hospital who was promised that he would get to go skiing. I remember the skiing adverts as a young woman. That is not the way it's now presented. And I think the point about the role of the armed forces, other than in conflict, is also a point well, well made. What it does to me is it flags up to me issues around who has gone into schools and what are the, what are the general protocols around somebody going in to pitch up to, to make a case for a particular career choice and what safeguards there are. I know there are some jobs I wouldn't have wanted um, my children to think about taking as a, maybe being an MSP being one of them. Um, but I mean, that, that's a slightly facetious point, but there, there, there is an issue about who gets access to young people in order to make an argument around what jobs are, are, are available to them. So I think, I, th I suppose what I'm saying is I think the choice for the petition committee is to close it or to think about a report which would present you know, the balance of arguments that have been presented to us, Michelle? Yeah, I mean, I obviously I expressed my opinion at the last one that I, I did feel we should close it. Um, I, you know, if, if the majority of the committee feel a report is the way forward, then then fair enough. And if that is, is about a balanced exploration of where we are, my, my concerns around this position ha had partly been the content of some of the evidence that's been put before us, particularly in the response that we are given by the petitioners, and um, a lot of it is outdated um, and doesn't take into account the changes that have taken place over the last few years. There is some contradictions where they, they talk about the information and then they refer to it later as being, you know, well, actually, we, that wasn't clear. Um, and they say that the summary of issues, that there are five key areas of concern regarding the armed forces visits to schools. They identify the first one as the level and distribution of the visits. And throughout their report, that their argument seems to be that they target um, particularly urban areas, areas of deprivation, that they focus mainly on state schools and not on the independent sector. Um, my commentary to that is, is, is twofold. Um, recruiting offices are based in urban areas. Of course they are, because it's about access. Um, and therefore, quite often they are you know, the, the, the volume of the, of the forces is closer to that point. But the key thing about this is that they don't force their way into schools. They don't say, we are coming. The schools ask them to come. And that is the only way they can go into a school. And therefore, is the argument that our teachers and our head teachers are the problem? And, and I just don't think that is the case. Um, I do have faith in our teachers and our head teachers that we're in deciding to allow the armed forces to come and take part in activities within the school, they are balancing a duty of care to the young people in that process. In terms of the argument that they're in state schools and not in independent schools, um, that, that's a bit of an odd argument because a vast majority of independent schools have CCF combined cadet forces based in the school. And many of those CCF have what we call permanent staff, i.e. Um, so, you know, actual regular soldiers or soldiers that are employed by the army supporting the delivery of that. So they have armed so the forces based are being in the school. They don't need to visit. Well, and also independent, independent schools mm -hmm. only make up four percent of yeah. the education system. But, but if they're already there, they wouldn't count as a visit. In no, they wouldn't count as a visit. And you could argue, in some ways, that they're being more influenced by the armed forces because they're permanently based within the school. So, so that argument doesn't hold water for me at all. Um, in terms of the types of activity, careers awareness or recruitment, well, I would accept that it's careers awareness. Of course it is, because anybody that's in a school that's from an organisation, of course they're promoting careers awareness. But the word recruitment means that you're actively recruiting and signing people up to do it. 
Um, and they are absolutely not doing that. They are not allowed to do it. And I can say that with absolute knowledge because I've been part of the system of doing that, of, of, of being in the school with the forces and talking to children. And it is not about signing somebody up for the job. They can't do that. They're not allowed to do that. Um, and actually, the process of recruitment is quite different. They have to go to the recruiting office. They're encouraged to bring their parents with them, um, particularly if they're younger. So, you know, again, I think that, that displays a degree of misunderstanding of how the system works. Um, they say students aren't always encountering a balance of views on the armed forces. Um, I read through, and I've read through, I've received a lot of letters um, from Quakers sort of asking for support. Some of them, I have to say, have been extremely balanced and, and very good, some less so. Um, but throughout it, I've been unclear what it is they mean by a balance of views. Because, I th again, I think schools do address this in lots of their, through modern studies, through PSE, there's a lot of discussion around some of that. And I, I'm slightly concerned at their indication that they do not think young people are capable of making decisions. Because we, have a par as a parliament, have decided that 16-year-olds can vote, that they have the intelligence, the ability to rationalise, look at these moral dilemmas, look at the... the um, the, the, I suppose, the wider aspects of what Parliament does and what the country does, and we've said that they are able to make those decisions, and yet the argument in this petition seems to be that children can't do that. So you can't have it both ways. Either they are, mm -hmm. and we have decided as a Parliament they are, so we can't now sit here as a petition visit, oh yeah, but where it comes to the armed forces, they're not capable of making a decision, because I, I, I just think that is fundamentally who, who you know, hypocritical in terms of, of the argument. Um, in terms of insufficient consultation with parents and guardians, parents and guardians are aware that they come in. It, it, you know, the children talk about it. If they came and the parents weren't happy, then parents can write into a school and say, I'm sorry, I don't want my child to take part in that. The parent is always free to do that. I don't I mean, I, I mean when we to watch, we don't spend too long on this, but I wonder whether... Is there a, a mechanism by which people are advised ahead of visits? Some, some schools withdraw, do. Withdraw some schools children? do. Is and that some maybe schools something don't. that a report could reflect on whether there's there some mm -hmm. kind of mechanism um, for just a, I mean, I certainly recall myself that any kind of visit, very often you were told to advise a parent such and such a yes. group is coming in. Mm -hmm. right. But whether that's something that could be regularised, with, mm -hmm. or we'd be interested whether it's possible to regularise it mm -hmm. through the school system or not. Um, I just. Can I just say finally, the lack of yep. transparency, the teachers are there, the teachers see everything that goes on, um, and one of the arguments is that they, keep, you know, they come back and do other visits, so there's been absolute transparency in terms of the school, and the school have deemed themselves happy to have them back again, so you know, I think there is transparency, you know, and, and actually if, if, if members of the committee are unhappy about it, they can go and visit a school and see it in action as well. Okay, I'm going to take Ron in a moment, um, but I wonder, mm -hmm. Morris, if there's anything you want to say before we come to... Yeah, uh, thank you, um, Kavina. Um, ba basically, um, we don't want to deny the young people the opportunity of seeing another career ahead of them uh, as a possible option. Um, we don't want to disadvantage young people uh, for not considering the opportunities to join the armed forces. And remember, that's the underwritten rule and now in, since 2011 in the Armed Forces uh, Community Covenant, which is signed up by government and is signed up by every local authority in the United Kingdom. And therefore, subsequently, that falls down to the schools <coughs> as well. Um, it is, I mean, the head teachers do have a control on, on who comes to the school to, for, for career programs. Certainly in my experience as a counsellor in Argyll and Butte, there was no question. They all put out visit programs and they all put out the invitations to the respective services to come and visit. Um, I don't think there is at all any targeting of state schools more than private schools, uh, and I think the, 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 the figures reflect that. Um, and I think there's fairness across all schools. Um, certainly, there are some who get slightly um, more, more um, enthusiastic when they come and visit. I heard a case in Oban of that, um, but that was rectified. Uh, very quickly and very quickly by the by the resident headmaster who was there, um, but there was there was no problem. There is always the opportunity for parents to to um, have an opt out by the headmaster when he does the programme, 
or the teacher in, in charge of that program for that school. Um, and therefore, there's going to be more visits, possibly uh, a, a presence for, you say, where areas, and there's, there's obviously Fast Lane uh, in, in Helen's area, there's Lossiemouth, Kinloss, there's Edinburgh, there's Lucas, um, et cetera, where you're going to have more presence of military, and I in return from Lucas yesterday where I saw that, and, and therefore there's going to be more knowledge of the armed forces there. So there's going to be probably more, more opportunity for people to go to school, and I don't think we should be restricting that. Um, yes, one thing that I did have a concern about was, um, and slightly surprised, is yes, the, the, the military should keep a record of their visits to the schools. I think that's quite clear. Um, and that's something I know that seems to slip since 2011, so I think it's something that needs to be looked at from that point of view. Um, I, I think there's uh, a lot of head of steam built up over this uh, from, from, from the petitioners, uh, and I think there's a realisation, or non-realisation, exactly what good that these recruiting um, efforts are doing to help the children see what's available to them. And remember, within the armed forces, there's an enormous amount of uh, jobs there which are involving uh, non-combatant roles. I mean, they are in support. There is a lot of uh, the question of cyber. There's a lot of questions of, uh, of dog handling. There's nursing. There's everything. There's medical. And if they've only got to look at what the success of the medical evacuation team in Afghanistan, uh, and I know I was there, was down to uh, people who had been recruited as nurses in Dundee and actually formed the major part of the air evac team. Uh, and those had been recruited from schools over the time. So I think it's a, an opportunity that people should not be allowed to miss. Yeah, once you go on that, once you can. And then we have to come to a conclusion as a committee. <clears throat> I'll be as brief as I can. Just to put the alternative view to what we've been hearing and it's the petitioner's view as well. Um, the Army makes more visits to state schools than any other public sector organisation. Um, there is evidence of them cold calling schools, so they're not always invited. Um, I'm extremely concerned that they also visit, on occasion, primary schools and special schools. Um, and as, as far as recruitment goes, of course they're not going to go and sign up children there and then to join the army. It is a sublim subliminal uh, visit. Um, no organisation would do that. That's not the point. They are there to, to say what a good career choice it would be to go in the army, and that's un indisputable. So I th I'm far from uh, convinced that we should close this petition. We should certainly have a report, and I think we, we need to get further, further information. Okay, thanks, Rona Angus. Thanks, um, Can I just say I value the comments from uh, Edward Mountain, uh, Maurice Corey, and Michelle Valentine, who've um, got a background in in the armed forces and and take on board much of of what they say. Um, however, I think attempts to shut down this petition are premature. Uh, I, th I also think, given Edward Mountain's uh, views um, that that he put forward, actually gives weight to the need for this committee to uh, compile and publish a report uh, to give justice to the p petitioners as well as to uh, the armed forces. So um, I would reiterate my, my request uh, that this committee consider um, uh, a petition uh, as a way forward, given the polarised views that there clearly are. Well, I'm in the happy position of not being polarised, okay. I guess, on it. I'm kind of trying to think. I mean, I'm very... St I'm struck by the fact the Scottish Government seems to be content with where we've got to, and I, and I know the evidence we took from them, they felt that that balance was right and that there were safeguards. And I think the issue is really around safeguards. Um, there may be sort of folk who think there should be no safeguards, and there's other folk who think under no circumstances should the armed force be allowed to go into schools. Um, then, but there is a there is a middle ground here, which I feel that's where the Scottish government is sitting in this, and, I've, and I've, I'm quite interested by that and, and that sense that there has been movement, um, and the sense that it is still a, a you know it's it's useful for young people to be given the proper advice about the range of things that the armed forces do, um, and I think the discussion has been useful in, in illuminating that. Might I suggest, I think, on balance, the balance of the committee is thinking that we should have um, a report that would afford the opportunity to, to both to highlight, and I think a lot of it's been put on the record today, um, both the kind of the, 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 the perhaps less black and white view of what the role of the armed services are, but we can explore further what those safeguards might look like and the extent to which the Scottish Government would feel that they've already been established, if that's agreed. So we would be agreeing with the proposal put forward by Angus that we would 
uh, not close the, the, the petition, but ahead of doing so, we provide a report which kind of highlights these issues. Is that agreed? Thanks. You're looking sceptical. There we go. Oh, on, on, on the record. I think we are just questioning the judgment of teachers. And I, I, would, I, would close, I would close it if I had the choice. Yeah. I, th I think that. Yeah. I, th I think that's um, um, a legitimate point to make, but we have to kind of, obviously, we seek to kind of build a, a consensus in this. And I think any suggestion that either that schools are somehow railroaded in, we would want to test that argument. I think that's very important, and that we would that we do recognise the autonomy of schools and of teachers in making some of these decisions. However, if we can move on to the next petition. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your attendance. The next petition is Petition 1616 by John Shaw on parking legislation. At our last consideration of this petition in October, we agreed to ask the Scottish Government to notify the committee when the findings of a recent consultation on improving parking in Scotland were published. This was anticipated to be during autumn 2017. In correspondence with the clerks last week, the Scottish Government confirmed that publication has been delayed until the end of March. I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Angus? Yeah, convener, I think given that the, the findings of the consultation haven't yet been published, um, I think we should defer further consideration of the petition until uh, we have sight of the consultation findings. Is that agreed? I think so. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. In that case, we can move on. Um, the next petition for consideration is petition 1631 by Maureen McVeigh on child welfare hearings, which we last considered in October. Members will recall that the Family Law Committee of the Scottish Civil Justice Council commissioned research on case management last year. One of the recommendations of this research was to use note sheets to ensure information flowed between sheriffs in situations where scheduling meant the same sheriff was not able to remain with the case. A subcommittee was set up to consider this research. The committee therefore agreed at its meeting in October to ask the Scottish Government to provide an update and the consideration of the research as it was represented on this subgroup. The Scottish Government's written submission states that the recommendation to use note sheets was rejected by the subcommittee for a range of reasons as outlined in our meeting papers. The Government's submission also highlights that the Scottish Civil Justice Council agreed to carry out a consultation on the report by the subcommittee on case management of family actions, but that, that, but that there was currently no timetable for the consultation. The petitioner does not agree with the reasons provided by the subcommittee in terms of the decision to reject the use of note sheets. The petitioner is also of the view that one possible solution to address the concerns raised in the petition could be to hold hearings in specialised family law courts in Glasgow and Edinburgh, as these courts may be better equipped to deal with adversarial welfare hearings. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Just for a point of clarification, the, the suggestion that they're, they're dealt with in special courts, is, is was the petitioner suggesting that all people should travel to these courts? Because that was what kind of leapt out at me, and I was mm -hmm. slightly unclear mm -hmm. on that, because... I'm not sure we can we can ask for that. I, I mean, I, I, I'm very attracted to that argument around specialist courts, but whether specialists may be able to travel... Um, well, might well be a, a question that, that, that was my issue because mm -hmm. I, I, I would absolutely support the concept of, of having the specialised court, but the practical reality of that would mean that for some people they would be being asked to travel potentially long distances, mm -hmm. which actually would undermine the position, not support, support or help it. Um, and we've seen that with the closure of some of our local courts in rural areas mm -hmm. where actually it's causing quite intense problems mm -hmm. for people. So I, 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 would, I would have some jubility about that's okay. a suggestion. Brian? Mm -hmm. and if, we, if we define a specialist court, it's about the, the, it's about the expertise that are in the court at the time. Therefore, um, you know, and, and I know this does happen, that, that uh, you know, the specialist family lawyers do travel uh, um, uh, between courts. So um, I'm kind of, you know, as Michelle Ballantyne's alluded to, the idea of having specialist courts, fixed specialist courts, mm -hmm. I think would exacerbate the issue. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, to be fair to the petitioner, what my sense is the petitioner is trying to find a solution, since the solution that's been offered is not one that's acceptable. I have to say that I found the arguments against 
written notes I totally agree. unsatisfactory. Yeah, yeah. No, well, this is all that. too complicated. Yeah, I mean, yeah. if it's fundamentally okay. about, we know ourselves, you know, there's issues around, say, for example, if you call the police consist over a period of time because of a problem neighbour, one of the things that folk will say, I have to keep telling the story time and time again. And the argument made by the petitioner was that a lot of the information wasn't being captured. They had to tell the story again and again, and they felt it was to detriment of the the young person whose welfare was being um, um, addressed. And I do think that is an issue of concern. Mm -hmm. Michelle? Could I just make a comment about that? Because whilst whilst I understand what you're saying, and, and logically, yes, that would be the retort, um, I have to say that in my experiences of child welfare hearings, we did get into quite a lot of bogged down water with notes from meetings around who said what and whether that was correct. And so I have some empathy with the response. Mm -hmm. but I think um, the problem with the logic of that argument is, well, we can't capture it in written form. So who, who is capturing it? it? Well, well, yes, exactly. And but the frustration I think of the petitioner is that the argument, they were, effectively the story they were trying to tell was never told properly mm -hmm. because it was never captured. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's very... There must be a means by which, no matter how difficult I, I it is, where this, where the, where I the, think it just promotes the argument for digital um, technology even further. You know that 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 would that would solve it. You know if it's been it if it's there and it's recorded, then there's no need for notes. Um, but that's that's something that we that needs to be um, speeded up. I would suggest. Yeah, I want um, the transcript. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, these issues are going to be a matter of dispute anyway, aren't they? That's yeah. the, by the reality oh, of it. These are very difficult issues, but by simply not recording mm. the fact that the issues are at dispute doesn't seem to me to solve it. Mm. And I did find the, the it felt like there was all sorts of arguments but kind of missing what the frustration was, which was it having to rehearse again and again what the yeah, situation I, was. I the writing back and forth, it, it, I think that's not going to get us anywhere because <laughs> they're going to keep coming back with different views. So I wondered whether mm. if, if we want to pursue this, whether we we need to, to have people in the room and have a conversation rather than than writing back and forth because perhaps these need exploring. I'm not sure whether we're the right people to do it, mm -hmm. I have to say, mm -hmm. um, or whether whether there is somewhere that it can go to be explored in more depth than us because it it, it is, I certainly know, you know, it is, it is quite complicated. Time is a big factor in a lot of these. Um, and making sure that people come in prepared and, and, and well versed in in each case, uh -huh. and it is uncomfortable, and there are lots yeah. of lots of problems around it. I, I'm just slightly uncomfortable about whether we, as a petitions committee, writing back and forth to people are going to get very far no, on it. We're not, we're not going to do that. It feels wasteful to, of time yeah. for a, a, a welfare hearing not to have to hand the evidence that's already been accrued or Absolutely. accumulated, yeah. and mm -hmm. simply not recording it in some way doesn't solve the problem of there being complexities in, in, in the system. In fact, in my view, the opposite to you, I think that they would um, clarify these. I think we should no, be No, no, I didn't, I didn't, to be fair, I didn't say that. I said that in my experience, there were issues with it. Um, so I understand where they're coming from. I'm not saying it's right. Mm -hmm. But I think my, my key point here is I think we need to have some, some thought around if we, I mean, I would recognise as an issue, the petition recognise the issue, and I think probably the judiciary would recognise yeah. as an issue. But the question is, where does that need to go to be properly discussed and thought yeah. through? I think that's my, my issue okay. with this. Right. Mm -hmm. Personally, in this particular, I'm, I'm kind of with you. I don't understand why on earth you wouldn't record. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I, I agree with Michelle Valentine, we don't want to write back and forth. I, I, I am interested to have somebody sit up there and tell me why. They wouldn't not recording in, in, in that sort of information somehow helps the judicial system and helps mm -hmm. the health system. Yeah. But that, that, I mean, can, it's just the verbatim. It, it's not having verbatim notes that's the issue. Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure the not recording is, is down to sort of lack of technical ability in the courts right now. Mm -hmm. You know, which is, which is, you know. Uh, by, rec by recording, I think I just meant taking a note of. Oh, sorry, I thought yeah. you meant digital And I don't recording. even think yeah. it should yeah. be a verbatim report. The idea that you can't produce mm -hmm. a, a written note of what happened to mm -hmm. pass on to whoever's going to be dealing with yeah. the case It doesn't next. need to be a lengthy can I case history. Mm -hmm. Can I suggest that we do ask um, the government on their, on their view on this notion of fixed or 
uh, moving specialist courts, does that does that help? And I do think the petitioner it feels as if the petitioner is trying to move in order um, to be helpful, and perhaps we could get an update in the consultation, the case management of family actions reports. And it, by having the subcommittee, it seems to me they're recognising as an issue here, um, and I'm intrigued by by that. Is there anything else we might do? asking um, some of the larger charities that, that provide advocacy and support to children, for children and children welfare cases, because they will have a very good I'm wondering view on it. We mm -hmm. can maybe check what we already did in that. Um, it, when the I'm kind of behind the curve. Lodged, I can't recall, but that's yeah. maybe yeah. something, again, uh -huh. we could ask, um, you know, A, is it an issue, and B, how do we manage, without mm -hmm. it being overly mm -hmm. burdensome, but actually addressing the fact that the, the petitioner's argument that not doing it is creating a different yeah. kind of burden. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if that's agreed that we do write Scottish Government about the spe specialist courts issue, we ask for an update in the consultation and we maybe look at what um, charities and others might be saying on this question. OK, if that's agreed, then mm -hmm. we can move on yep. to the next petition, which is consideration of petition 1646 by Caroline Hayes on drinking water supplies in Scotland. The petition calls for a review of the role of the drinking water quality regulator and for independent research into the safety of chloromination of drinking water. We last considered this petition at our meeting on 26th of October 2017. Submissions considered at that meeting reflected views that there was no requirement or support for a review of the role of the drinking water quality regulator. We agreed, however, to ask Scottish Water what measures it has in place to monitor the safety of drinking water in Scotland. In its submission, Scottish Water explains that the purpose of chloromination is to ensure that drinking water remains free of harmful bacteria as it travels through the network to customers' homes. As our briefing paper identifies, the Scottish Water submission focuses almost entirely on the specific issue of the drinking water supply in the Badenoch and Strass Bay area. It does, however, set out some of the measures applied to monitor the safety of the water. These include online telemetry analysis and enhanced sampling and analysis, in addition to the regulatory sampling and analysis process. In a submission, the petitioner expresses a degree of dissatisfaction with the Scotch Water submission. She sets out concerns about the disinfection process and the potential adverse health impacts of the disinfectant byproducts generated through this process. The briefing note refers to recent correspondence to the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee from the Cabinet Secretary, which highlights that one of Scotch Water's priorities within its six-year investment programme is to maintain high-quality drinking water. I wonder um, if members have any comments or suggestions for action. I think Brian? we should refer. <laughs> I have... Uh... I very recently had a, a, a number of constituent letters come in um, from uh, Ayrshire uh, so, saying that they've had a letter through the door uh, just to say your water will now have this without any kind of consultation or any kind of explanation and uh, I think that, that worried, worries me greatly. Uh, obviously worries the, the, the constituents greatly because they, they don't know what it is that uh, the, the chlorination actually involves. And uh, I think over the over the piece, I, I, I you know I mean, my, my long ago background um, is is in chemistry, and I wouldn't understand quite uh, what, the, what, that, what the implications of that are. And I was looking at this this letter here, which says you know keeping the community on board, you know effective consumer engagement, and to me. Just writing to them to say that now your water is going to have this chlorim chlorimication is, is, is not keeping the consumer on board. And I think it raises some serious issues around uh, the implications uh, and implementation of, of changes within our water. And would your concerns be satisfied should we refer the petition to the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee, given they are doing some ongoing work? Relating to water and water quality, <clears throat> I think so. I think we should do that, but I just want to put that on the mm -hmm. record, and I think that should be part of uh, our, our, refer uh, uh, you know, our referral to say that uh, this this uh, consumer engagement is apparently not happening. Okay. Other views, Angus? Um, well, I think there's certainly a strong argument to to refer the petition to the Clear Committee. Uh, however. Um, I, 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 I serve on that committee, so I'm aware of the, the workload that it has, and 
there's no work on Scottish water uh, or water quality imminent. Um, so I, I wonder if maybe you could maybe hold on to this petition in the to ensure that or to ask the Scottish government um, to respond to the petitioner's concerns first. Mm. And then, uh, and then consider maybe passing it to the Clear Committee. But um, I'm happy to try and move it forward uh, at at the Clear Committee, if, mm -hmm. if if that's the decision of the committee, mm -hmm. the petitions committee today. Mm -hmm. um, My understanding is that the you have the chief executive of Scottish Water in, but perhaps that's one of the things we can. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that in itself wouldn't be necessarily sufficient to address no. the issues of the petitioner, mm. but it would afford an opportunity maybe to ask some of these questions. But the, mm. the argument is whether we could do that or they could do that. I mean, I think it's just about how most productively we could take the petition forward. I think, I think it has to be taken forward in some manner or other. Yeah. I think um. so. I, I tend to think it probably <coughs> the um, Environment Committee would have more time to, to dig deeper into it than, than we do. Um, and that they have been doing, um, you know, taking evidence on, on water and what. So I think it fits well. I, I appreciate what Angus is saying about workloads, but I think I'm not sure what more we can do if there's alternative work being done in another committee. Yeah. So I would refer. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy with that convener. Okay. And um, happy to try and move it forward at the, at the other committee. Okay, I think that uh, is exceptionally helpful. So if we can um, agree that we do refer the petition to the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee for its consideration, and perhaps the clerks can ensure that all of the comments in this petition, but specifically the, the issues raised by Brian Whittle, are highlighted to them. Okay, if we can then move on <coughs> to the next petition for consideration, is Petition 1668 by Anne Glenny on improving literacy standards in schools through research-informed reading instruction. We first considered this petition in November 2017 when we took evidence from the petitioner and supporters. Subsequent to that meeting, we have received six submissions which present two different and clear perspectives on the action called for in the petition. On the one hand, there are the submissions which acknowledge that there is a place for systematic synthetic phonics, but that this should be within a package of measures or tools to allow teachers to apply what they consider the most suitable approach for an individual pupil. The other argument presented by the petitioner and supporters is that due to the limitations and little official guidance within Curriculum for Excellence and the Polar Resource, teachers are hindered in being able to fully to consider the most appropriate approach for pupils. In his submission, the Deputy First Minister and Cabinet Secretary for Education and Skills says he is not convinced it would be helpful to prescribe one particular approach to teaching and reading. He does, however, acknowledge that there is a need for improvements to be made in literacy attainment levels. He indicates that to address this, he has invited Education Scotland, alongside the General Teaching Council for Scotland, to develop a new self-evaluation framework designed to support teacher training establishments and to develop a shared understanding of what can be done collectively to secure improvements. And I wonder if members have any comments on, or suggestions for action. Michelle? Um, well, ironically, I'm going to agree with the Deputy First Minister. Um, you know, I, I think I, I've been doing a lot of work around this stuff anyway, outside of, of petitions. Um, and this isn't a one system fits all by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and I think while the petitioner has some good points around phonics, um, it is one type of phonics, systematic synthetic phonics, is one, one, one approach. Um, and I I don't believe that it is right to put one approach down as, as a way forward for reading. Um, different children learn differently, that they need different things. Um, and I think isolating it is not the way forward. Quite often it does take a combination to, to promote effective literacy. Um, so, and, I, and we've got quite a lot of evidence in the papers here. So I, I actually am satisfied that there's a huge amount of work being undertaken on this at the moment. Um, a lot of the universities are engaged in it, um, you know, Glasgow are looking very hard at it. So I actually don't see the benefit actually in terms of pursuing this petition through here because I think, I think it is in hand. Um, and I think, you know, yes, more work needs to be done on it, but I don't think this, this particular petition with its, its narrow approach is the right way to go. Okay, Brian. 
After this is surprisingly sounding to me after that we had this petition the last time uh, I was bombarded by people who, <laughs> who had uh, both sides of it, both both opinions on this and and very strong opinions uh, on, on, on either side of this argument and uh, not, I, I was rather unexpected uh, on this particular petition. Um, I, I do I do agree with, with Michelle in that, that I think there's a one, one, this one size fits all that seems to be uh, being. Um, advocated by both sides of this. Uh, it d doesn't wash with me at all, but what I would quite like to do is understand, you know, uh, I think there is a lack of research, perhaps, or maybe, um, and I would quite like, as I say, I'd quite like to, the, to, to maybe seek uh, uh, the Deputy First Minister's um, uh, um, idea around this idea of being, this in, insufficient provision of research mm -hmm. um, around this, uh, and just wonder where, where that that research is currently going, um, but uh, as I said, it, it, it has, you know, had quite a strong reaction uh, at this petition, uh, and it'd be quite interesting to see, you know, see the deputy first minister's idea around, yeah. you know, how we're going to how, how we we move in and move forward and form. From what it was, I thought there was a bit of um, straw people being cut down in this argument. I mean. It, when you read the the papers, I don't on both sides, neither side says it's one size fits all, it should be in its context. And I found the argument <coughs> round young people who don't who have not got the riches of vocabulary or maybe the supports that they require to interrogate words and try and guess or try and make an intelligent assessment of what the word might mean, that actually mechanical <coughs> Breaking down of the words kind of makes sense. It, I was very taken aback by the controversy that it, it generated. Um, and I, I suppose the question I would ask is, if they're saying it's in the context of the GTCS says it's in the context of other things, do we know from well, what we're of the Colleges of Education now, um, initial training education within universities, of, because we, we took evidence in the Education Committee from um, people going through an initial teacher education, and one of the comments they made was they didn't feel they get enough training on literacy and numeracy to support them in order to teach children. So I'd be quite interested in, in what they do around this. I mean, what is prescribed? What is the expectation of all teachers? Um, certainly one of the big arguments in the, in the last period is that literacy and numeracy are not simply the, you know, the responsibility of maths and English departments. So, I would be quite interested in if it's to be contextualised, that kind of approach, is it contextualised into initial teacher education? And I agree with Brian that we should be asking the Deputy First Minister, you know, on this question of research into training. It opened up another uh, sort of uh, avenue for me in that the, the, the general consensus, you know, that. The, the, the current teaching uh, of English and, and, and maths works for 80% of, of, of children. It's that other 20% that they maybe look for a different uh, a, a different way of, of, of learning, and, and that speaks again to the educational support mechanisms within here. In the, where, where, do, where does this the, the teaching of, of English through phonics lie? Is it within general mainstream, or is it with uh, those children who... Respond better to that kind of that kind of need, and, and how, how do we do? Do we do that? Mm -hmm. Of people who have reacted to the evidence that we heard, my sense was they were saying, "Wait a minute, it would be have to be con in the context of other things, and there would there would be other options." What I was struck by, I guess, in reflection, I think we all found the evidence at the time very interesting. I suppose the question was, if it's so self-evidently successful, why would people turn their face from it? Mm -hmm. You know, if it was so good, why would people who care about education of our young people willfully not do it? Yeah. And actually, that's what I mean about the straw people argument. I think they're probably closer than yeah. than either side is characterised as. That it's 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 the context within which and what other you wouldn't just have one way of doing things. There are, there are as many ways as there are young people yeah. with the needs that they've got. And I think it's big. It's around um, limitations of a single method um, because um, systematic um, synthetic phonics is, is about learning the letters, putting them together to make the sound. Whereas the other side of the argument is, is reading is about comprehension, not just 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 the words. And and 
the, there has been some studies and some some um, research, I think Strathclyde came out of Strathclyde, where they're actually finding that, that yes, they've learned that and they can read it, but then when you ask them, so what was it about? What actually mm -hmm. happened? Mm -hmm. they, they haven't, they haven't, that analytical mm -hmm. side has been lost mm -hmm. and they haven't got the comprehension side. Mm -hmm. So I think this, that was, that is the real concern is that, you know, you have to have that balance. Um, and I find it odd that after, you know, hundreds of years of schooling, we're actually even sitting here having this discussion about how to teach people to read. Um, but, but there are, you know, it's this thing about fashionable ways of doing it. Um, and rather than that, that broader, you know, looking at, well, actually you need, you need some mm -hmm. sort of different things to make it actually come together and work. Um, and I don't think, my, my problem is not with, uh, there is nothing wrong with, you know, systematic synthetic phonics in itself. But what they're saying here is this should be the way we teach literacy. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is I think actually the evidence doesn't support that. It is one part of a puzzle. Um, well, and I think that's really what the Deputy First Minister was saying. The only thing I would say in return to that is mm -hmm. that in their own evidence, they say they're not saying it's the one yeah. option, but they feel it's an option that's excluded. Yeah. And I think that's where we're, what we're trying to explore. Mm -hmm. Can I suggest we agree to write to the Deputy First Minister, as has been indicated, and that we write to the the, the teacher initial teacher education uh, institutions task, you know, mm -hmm. how do they contextualise that kind of, of training? And if that's agreed, we can move on to the next petition, which is Petition 1670 by James Cassidy on reforming the Scottish electoral system to make it democratic and accountable. At our last consideration of this petition in October, we agreed to seek the views of the Scottish Government and the Electoral Commission on the action called for in the petition. The Electoral Commission submission sets out some concerns about the impact of any removal of the dual candidacy process and notes that the issue of dual candidacy has not been reflected as an issue in any of its attitudinal research conducted following each Scottish Parliament election to date. The Scottish Government also observes that dual candidacy is not an issue that has been contact contacted about recently. It refers to its plans to conduct a consultation, and our briefing paper confirms that the consultation ran from 19 to December 2017 and closed at the start of this week on Monday the 12th of March. In its correspondence, the Scottish Government indicates that if responses to the consultation reflect dual candidacy as an issue, it would give it further consideration. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. I mean, I, I should... I would close it. <laughs> yeah, I should say that this yeah. was, and I mean, mm. certainly my own party argued to legislate for this. Mm. Once the legislation wasn't agreed and there wasn't an, a, an appetite for that, what you ended up seeing, certainly in our own party, was a shift because they felt that it was a self-denying ordinance that wasn't happening elsewhere in the system. And, therefore, and I think you can see in, in the Welsh example, it's interesting why the Welsh moved to that position and then moved away from it again. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I suppose you know, we, we have a choice. We could maybe ask the Scottish Government for its time scale for publication of the outcomes of its consultation, or we could simply close the petition on the basis that it will give um, that information. I'd be inclined to close it, I think, yeah. because mm -hmm. you know, the outcome will be forthcoming and that will be the answer, really, to the petition. So. I also think it only looks at one side of the fence, if you like, because there are parties that don't put up any constituency candidates and therefore do much better on the list because they're not affected by the downgrading, mm. you know, the, the, the multiplier of, of not having any constituency candidates. So I, I think, I, I don't know that it stacks up in terms of what the, the electorate think. Mm. Um, and I think whatever, whatever, whatever process we choose, there'll be a problem with in some mm. form or other. Yeah. It may <laughs> It'll be, never be perfect. Yeah. It may be <laughs> that... Um, mm. Given we have an interest in a self-interest, and it's more difficult for us to provide an objective way forward. So perhaps it is therefore it's a matter for the Scottish government is consulted broadly, um, and it has to be within it has to be within the, the guidelines of the electoral commission. And the electoral commission are in this, whereas mm. none of us, the Parliament and us, aren't. Mm. And if the electoral commission is is satisfied, then I don't I think, think so. we can really argue with that. Okay, Brian mm. Angus. I think it was it, 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 it was an interesting uh, thought thought process afterwards, as, as, and my conclusion was it would drive a different kind of behaviour 
uh, within candidates in, in terms of whether they stood as a in a constituency or whether they, they, they decided not to do that and stay on the list. Uh, I think it would drive a different kind of behaviour and, and, and therefore it would you'd have different kinds of uh, candidates being put forward in constituency. It, 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 I think it just opened a whole minefield mm -hmm. uh, We for did me. it and it's, it does have... There is no perfect system in my view mm -hmm. and both systems have both good and bad consequences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Angus? Nothing to add, Camina. Right. Do you have a view on whether we should close it or not? Um, well, yeah, I'm, I'm struck by the fact that uh, in the papers, the, the, the petitioners only contacted the seven, his seven regional list MSPs. Um, and it, he doesn't seem to have contacted the Electoral Commission or made his views known to the Electoral Commission, which I thought would have been um, one of the first steps to take. Mm -hmm. Um, and of course, that option's still open to him. But yeah, I'd be minded to close the petition. Okay. So if it's agreed that we um, close the petition on on the grounds that the Scottish government has indicated, it will give further consideration to the action called for in the petition. Should the matter of dual candidacy be raised as a significant issue in response to its consultation, and obviously, we want to thank the petitioner for bringing this forward. And there is always an opportunity to revisit the issue through a further petition if we if the consultation itself highlights those kinds of concerns. Okay, if we can then move on to uh, the final petition for consideration today, which is petition 1671 by Lisa Harvey and Andrea Goddard on behalf of Let's Get Mad for Wildlife on the sale and use of glue traps. At our first consideration of this petition in October 2017, we took evidence from the petitioners and agreed to seek the views of a range of stakeholders from the pest control profession and from animal welfare groups. As our briefing note identifies, the responses received acknowledge the concerns and issues raised by the petition. The submissions indicate support for restrictions in the sale and use of glue traps by members of the public. The principal conflict between the submissions is whether there should be an outright ban or whether glue traps should be available to professionals within the pest control sector. The submissions from within the pest control industry argue the need to keep the glue traps available for use within the profession on the grounds of public health. They highlight that any professional within the pest control sector should be sufficiently trained and qualified in the use of glue traps. Members will note that the British Pest Control Association highlights the fact that there is currently, quote, no clear definition of professional pest control operatives. The submissions from the Scottish SPCA, British Veterinary Association and Humane Society International UK indicate they would ultimately like to see a total ban on the sale and use of glue traps, but at the very least, any use within the pest control sector should be subject to strict requirements. The petitioners welcome the fact that all the responses acknowledge the need to restrict the sale and use of glue traps for use by the general public. They acknowledge the public health perspective presented by the pest control industry submissions, but suggest that it is the responsibility of that industry to come up with new, humane and effective pest control mechanisms. The Scottish Government outlines um, three options that it is currently considering in terms of the use of glue traps and indicates that it would be interested to hear the committee's views on these options. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Rona? I, personally, I mean, I, I think they should be banned, but I think um, I'd like to, to hear evidence from um, the Minister and the Cabinet Secretary about it because... Um, this may be affected by the withdrawal bill anyway. It's an animal welfare issue. Um, so I think it's a kind of moving uh, a moving picture, but ultimately I, 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 you know, I personally would like to see them banned, but evidence I think would be good so that we know where we are with it. Okay, is that agreed? Yeah, yeah. I think we probably all, I just find the evidence horrific. Yeah. Um, and I, I respect the fact that people, professionals working in the field may be able to see options, but it would be interesting to know what on earth these could possibly be, but I, I, I mean, you, we can only ex accept that there's, that's their professional expertise, although the fact that perhaps a definition of a professional is vague is also an issue. So I think we are agreeing um, that we invite the Scottish Government to give evidence a future meeting, which would not necessarily be the Minister, it may be the officials who are operating in the field. If you prefer the Minister, we can simply ask for the Minister. Minister to give evidence on why 
some, a partial ban would be appropriate. Well, what, think, why would they be the best no, person? I, I think, I'm slightly confused. I suppose I would. Well, I what I would be interested in either minister, Scottish government officials, but perhaps the minister might be the easier way to do it. It's just simply to look at what they're doing, what the options are that are open to them, and what what do they perceive to be the strengths and weaknesses of each of the arguments. Mm. Brian, simple question for me would be how how they define a professional in that in that particular arena. Mm -hmm. Well, it may be that that's the kind of question mm -hmm. that they are wrestling with, which takes them from, you know, being um, not absolutely convinced in a total ban. We wouldn't be precluded taking evidence from other groups once that yeah. um, presentation is here, but I think that would be useful. Mm -hmm. Is that agreed? Yes, yeah. agreed. Okay. Um, in that case, that um, is the end of our um, public consideration of... of um, uh, petitions and we'll close this session um, and go into private session. <laughs>